We'll dial her up on FaceTime. Yeah, uh, I don't think she. Yeah. She's a pretty tough so cookie. You, right? Susan's a pretty tough cookie. When Susan says I'm not gonna go, I'm like okay. Yeah. Because <laughs> she's not faking it. So, anyway, you want to start with we'll start with Susan's process. We'll add we'll add in some of the yeah. things we bring. Susan and Mel and I have kind of brainstormed about this a couple mm -hmm. times just to cover some things that that um, were. Uh, condition of multiple offers are a part of the multiple offer process somewhere along the line but we'll start with her notes and then we'll just add in whatever you guys want and talk about whatever you want is that okay mm -hmm. and it was going to be sanctioned because when Susan speaks I'm like oh, yeah yeah everything you say is okay with the broker but that one I don't know <laughs> You're not, you didn't record that part did you <laughs> No, I get in trouble a lot. <laughs> yeah. Now, and I sit next to Susan, so Susan's office is next door, so anything she says, I hear everything, as she does me. So what she started out with is, you know, with our listing, and I, we did not print off a copy of the listing, but I'll pass this around so when we're going through the topic, you can see what she marks on her listings. So I changed that. Are you guys aware of that? We have that option on the listing? So, for disclosing, disclosure authorizations for motivating factors, offers, and terms. So that is one section I'm going to show you on here that goes along with what she's using right now. So I didn't do a good job. So Susan's, Susan's method that she's fall, fallen into and she's had some really good luck is just the very, being very transparent. So you check mark on your listing that you can disclose the terms and price. So, because that's an option, mm -hmm. can or can't. And if you decide to go this way, you have to have the seller's permission. So the seller has to understand. So that's the first part of it. Her, she wanted to teach her, her way, if you will. And the good part about it is I haven't had one agent kickback, not one. And I, ha I haven't had, you know, usually in multiple offers, you have a winner and you have a loser. And the losers don't like it. And the losers turn on the agents. Like it or not, the calls I get, your agent didn't do this right. Really, well, tell me about it. You know, and you go through the process and you try to be empathetic, but the bottom line is the people didn't make as good offer as, as they would have. Well, they would have paid more, too late. Susan's deal is different. You're, you're listing out terms and conditions and price and you're openly sharing that with all agents involved. So to start, you you said you got to check the box on the listing, but I didn't tell them what the. Yes, so I have one that I, they're passing around so you can see which box that is. But when I learned how to do this, I actually watched Susan. I think she did it last year. She started out doing it. And I enjoyed it from an agent standpoint because I didn't feel like I didn't have a fair shot for the client. So I said, I love this theory because you know normally you do highest and best. Well, you never know, well, how far did I lose by it? Should I have done this? You get all these pushbacks. So this way, not only is the buyer on the same page, they're aware of everything, but so is the agent. So there's no hard feelings later on. You know, if you you end up at 300 and your guy was only gonna pay 275, I'll be like, look, you lost, because we had access to see those people paid 300. So you need, you need to feel good about your decision. Okay. Yeah. We didn't want to talk about it. Sorry. No. <laughs> okay. So, what I do understand when she goes in for that listing, so if we are a seller's agent, this is on our handout, she looks at what type of property she's going to be listing because this is not something you need to mark for every property per se, but anymore it feels like it is every property we're listing. Um, so, when she's in the listing, and I'll maybe use an example I did because um, she showed me how to do it. So when I went into the property, I knew it was going to be hot. It was a condo. And I said, okay. So a strategy that we're using is that we will mark that you will be okay with disclosing the terms and the conditions and all of that to each agent. And then we're going to give a time frame. So we'll say, okay, if we list it on Thursday, then we'll accept offers until Monday, say at noon. We'll take them up to then, and then we'll get back to them that evening. But if we're going to do this, you have to agree with me. We're not going to take an offer right away. Because I am going on my, you know, my reputation to my fellow agents. 
and I'll say, listen, I really want to do a good job, but no offense, we're going to maybe work once together. I'm going to work with the rest of these agents hundreds of times, and I need them not to be upset at me. So we have to be in agreement. We're not just going to take that second or third one that you love because you don't know yet. Because this can get us really crazy, and this may flop in our face. Because I did this twice last week, and I didn't get any offers on one. So I had to call back, and I go, well, that strategy. This is a humbling call. We didn't get one contract. We had one showing. My bad. Whoops. So does, does everybody understand that part of it? And you're going completely transparent on the price. I mean, it's um, almost like an auction. So with the seller, when you're listing, mm -hmm. right? You're trying yeah. to be so when you're when you're sitting with the seller, you're explaining the, mm -hmm. the different methods of how to handle if we have multiple offers. And what Susan's saying is, if you're sitting there listening, you can anticipate the possibility of getting multiple offers. You can explain this strategy, see if they're okay with it, and then determine what box to check. Um, one thing Troy said is a hot button. You will actually have agents challenge you on the right that this is legal or not, because they'll think that it's an auction. Just to clarify, it's not an auction. Everything is in writing. You're not doing anything verbally. We never do anything verbally. Um, and you've, you've, your seller knows that you have the right to disclose because of that. So, so that's jumping a couple steps. So no, it's okay, I'm glad you brought it up because that is, I, I mean, we, we've heard, called the commission a couple times over it. I've heard her do this. Yes. And it's pretty cool. I wish more people did. It's different. Mm -hmm. So I do, I use those check marks all the time. Okay. But when it comes to transparency, does she go ahead and tell, tell the exact figure? I'm going to go, we're going to go through that step by step. So, no, it, it's good because that's where it gets dicey. Okay. So, mm -hmm. um, but here's what agents are doing right now, and this is where where Mel alluded to. So you have a new listing, you list it on Thursday, um, but you say you're not going to entertain offers until Monday. Just my opinion, that the, and, and frankly, the seller always has the right to accept an offer, always. But what Mel just said, and what Susan does, I think is really important, and that is, if you explain that strategy to your seller and your seller agrees with it, tell them, I mean, write it in the listing that this is what you're gonna do. Because what you don't want is you don't want an aggressive agent on Saturday presenting a sight unseen, great offer, and then the seller's taken and all the other agents that were working hard to do this that would have provided motivation and and excitement that could have driven that up, they're all out the door and you have to call them. And I bet we, you know, when we first started seeing this stuff happen, I bet we had that happen to us five or six times. Not an agent's fault, uh, not really the seller's fault, just they get scared sometimes. We had it almost derail right in our own office when we had a client agree to this but then got scared because two or three days in it, they only had one offer. Got real nervous. Well, this is a good offer. Maybe we need to take this. And you know, the agent on the other end is going, you better take that because it's going to be off the table by, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So if you pick that route, my opinion is you stay strong. You should be the, you should be the, the one driving that bus if that's what you're doing. Because you're putting it in MLS, you're, you're broadcasting that to all the agents. Lots of agents won't write the offer until the last few hours. So anyway, that's just an opinion. Do you agree with that? Oh, I do, because if I'm a buyer's agent and I know I've got till Monday at 10, I'm gonna play my time, and I'm probably gonna send it to you at nine on Monday morning, because I don't wanna, because I know if they're doing this strategy, and we'll go through it, and I'm jumping a little bit, but I know I'll get to see what everybody, or they're already fighting amongst themselves, I want to save myself time and just come in at that nine o'clock. Susan, time. Susan actually says, explain to the sellers mm -hmm. that they will likely not hear from you on Sunday. <laughs> so if Sunday's mm -hmm. your day, you'll not hear from me because I'll be, you know, I'll because you'll be busy fielding the offers, changes, details on the offers until close to the deadline. Let them know that once the deadline is up, you'll be in contact to go over all the offers with them. I do try to update the sellers as often as I can, especially with the new offer come, when new offers come, 
come in, but sometimes at the end it's too crazy to do that. She's just setting them up in the beginning of what she's going to do during the process so that they will stick with the game plan. That's all. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. So what she'll do in the office, so uh, the last one she did, I think she had 10 offers. You'll literally walk in her desk or in her office and she's going to lay them all out on the floor. Offer one, offer two, offer three, so they're all spread out. And then she'll take it so she'll put in into an email to all the agents that are involved with it. And she normally will do it, you know, offer one, offer two, but you are actually listing out, okay, offer price 300, cash, um, not contingent upon, appraisal, inspections out 10 days, earnest money is this, closing date is this, possession at closing. So she's giving it all the details, not the buyer's names, but you are laying out the terms and conditions right. right there in that email. So that's why she keeps them kind of all in order so she can go back and change it if she needs to. So this starts on the top of the second page, mm -hmm. Kevin. This is exactly what you, and she kind of wrote out exactly what she does. Um, Jane has a spreadsheet that we I was going to say, I have that, a spreadsheet that, that I yeah, use. Perfect. And we, so as we get the offer, we enter them in so that... Right. <laughs> and hers looks like a, when she has that email chain, hers looks like a spreadsheet too. It is basically where it's kind of nice Yeah. Yeah. Same mm -hmm. difference, yeah. Whatever works, right? right. For sure. Um, lot, you know, it's... it's um, Keep what going, you, do, Mel. you know, and I've done this on the buyer side where I call the agent and go, okay, what do you got? Because, mm -hmm. and you know, that conversation can go a lot of different ways. I had to call you on that one agent, didn't I, Jen? Yeah. Um, that wasn't great. Um, so if I know, if I know I, I've got a buyer who's willing to go higher and I'm, I'm trying to convince them to go higher, I mean, do you have that conversation Sunday and say, hey, you know, I've I'm gonna pull my offer back and redo it and give you an update. So she actually talks about that too. <laughs> um, so just to try to stay on Susan's deal, let me read some okay. of this. It's gonna be repetitive, but I think it's important and you guys will take this with you. She says, um, you know, just what Mel said, covering the highlights, include all agents who submitted offers on the email chain, which we know. She said she does her best to keep everyone updated by the minute up until that 4 p.m. deadline. So if something comes in, she's on it. I, she said, I give a last call for changes and then I stop the offers of changes. One of two things happens next. Either you have one offer that really stands out from the other so much that the sellers choose it. Choose that one. Or you have 15 offers with four of them being nearly identical as far as price terms, earnest money, closing, etc. If the latter is true, then it's up to you as a seller's agent to explain that from the 15, four are the best for the seller. Then go over each of the four in detail with the seller. You can go back to those four agents then and give them one last opportunity to change your offer. So, so you're going back just to see, just kind of like a highest and best at that point once you've narrowed it all the way down, um, which I think is, Pretty important because if you if you don't you stand the risk of, of somebody not making that change so that's generally what she does after explaining that the 15 offers were received however four really stood out the best and resend to each of those four offer highlights give them 30 minutes to an hour to improve or change their offer typically one or two will do something like increase earnest money drastically and or make it non-refundable and that will be enough to win advise sellers that they're now seeing the buyers make offers with terms they cannot live up to. So requiring proof of, is that proof of funds? Yeah. Proof, of proof of funds and or large earnest money deposits is strongly suggested. What if she's got one they haven't been through it? Silencing. I, you know, I think the same applies. Mm -hmm. I think today, and, and this is a separate, on a, later we're gonna talk about this, but I think today we're seeing cash offers that aren't cash offers. Oh, oh yeah. So yeah, when you that can, when, that can be a contingency line, you know, they're like, well, it'll be contingent upon my client coming down in six yeah, days to yeah. see it. Well, that's going to knock them down. I mean, it'd be a negative today. For sure. I don't write it if they haven't seen it in person. I won't let and that there's, agent there's know. Two, there's two agents that do that all the time. We don't let the other agent know it's a side and scene? No, because you'll kick me out. Yeah. yeah we don't, me either. We don't Even though you don't turn in the side and scene, right? Nope. Mm -hmm. So as no. a seller's agent, agent then, 
it's real important to ask all the questions because mm -hmm. if I know that my cash offers don't really mean cash, they just mean somebody smart enough not to put a appraisal or a financing contingency yeah. in there, then we need to make sure that if the cash offers are the ones who win, they gotta have enough skin in the game, earnest money, mm -hmm. to make it stick. Well, I, so I think we're gonna see that a lot. Last week they wrote a cash offer. She said, okay, great, this is awesome. They won, that was on a Seascape. I think she had 20 on that one. Well, a day before closing, the other agent said, I'm sorry, they didn't get their loan. We need an extension. They already had moving trucks. They needed those funds to close on a house for their son. They and it was a date. cash offer. But the contracts tell you you can do that. You bet you they can do, do it. it. They do. Yeah. But she goes, what do you mean? We need those that money tomorrow. I mean, it was a cluster. Just because you don't make a decision on the loan doesn't mean they can't get it. That's them. right. Yeah. So, and but then, you know, it's not something we had to pay attention to. <coughs> can, can we, and when we counter to them, say... Anything that counters that in the contract? No, Does they say, can always get a loan. I mean, they can get a loan. You know. But they have, can they have to buy regardless of getting a loan or not? Can we say something like that? Within the time? There's well, no financing contingency. The problem is when you yeah. get up to, when you get that close to a closing, the only thing that hurts is earnest money. Mm -hmm. If I can walk away because of something that went wrong and it's easy for me, I'm going to do it. If that's my opinion. I mean, the only you know the only mm -hmm. way to really counter that, I think, is to counter your earnings money. Do you well, agree? Well, earnings money. I, mean, I did for my last one, and actually Kyle and I did it together. So his offer is cash, and I said, "Is it really cash? Do they have money in their account?" You know, he's in here, right? I know. Okay. But yeah, but I but that's why I drilled you down so hard because I'm like, I got burnt last week. Where they were getting a loan, and then all of a sudden they go, Well, it didn't you appraise. Can't believe a word he said. <laughs> so I had to argue with an appraiser, and we had to extend for two weeks. I go, Why am I arguing with an appraiser? So you know when you know, you're but they were doing a loan, and he goes, Well, we knew we wouldn't get it. This was a different deal. If we put it contingent upon appraisal or a loan, I go, Well, shit. I, went, I ain't messing around with this for two weeks. I thought I had a done deal. So now I'm like, No, I really want to know. <laughs> exactly. Because I mean, I said, so, oh, cluster. So, do you know, you know, her opinion on submitting letters, photos with offers? She actually had that as red. Do you know her opinion? Because I, I'm not real sure. It does help because I actually won one with her. Um, it appeals to the seller as long as we're still allowed to do it. I know Nar is discussing whether or not we can do it. But the people that wrote an offer on one of her houses, this was when he, she first started doing this, they actually got married right down the road. They wanted to be where they got married. They talked about raising their children. They were not the highest offer, but they were the best terms. But the lady was an S personality, and she goes, oh, man, that touched my heart. We're getting way more than we wanted. We loved that they got married, and this is why they wanted to buy it for her anniversary present. So that helped. So she'll you can take whichever one you want. She goes, no, that that meant the most to me. So mm -hmm. we'll go with that one. So it didn't make a difference. I just had a couple get theirs because of that too. Mm -hmm. I yeah, just I've had others that didn't mean a thing. Yeah. Well, and and that's the chance. But but you know, if you could have done something different, why wouldn't you? <laughs> so if as a buyer's agent in these deals, why wouldn't you ask, hey, what's most important to the seller? We're getting ready to submit an offer. We know you're likely going to have other interests. What? What Can we just ask their this personality test results? <laughs> they're a, a D. I'm not even they're gonna, a high D. I'm not even gonna write right. a letter. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got into one the other day, and I called the agent, and I said, you know, what what would be the most important to your seller? You know, do they have to find another house? Would maybe if I gave you a week possession after closing, would that appeal to them? So they really know that they can close on their next house. There's cash in the hand. She goes, I mean, think about it. Yeah, that would. I'm like, okay. So I called the buyer back, I'm like, do you care if they stay there a week? If it means you can get the property, he goes, they can stay there a month. I don't need it. I need to secure it, but I, you know, they can close and stay there. I'm cool with it. I used to not be, but if I can win, I'll do it. Which I would have never asked that years ago. I would have demanded, oh my God, you gotta have, you know, possession upon closing, this is a nightmare. Maybe not. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I, I, I just don't see any negative with it. I, I mean. It, the, the, the more, I guess my opinion, the more bully an agent is in a multiple offer, the buyer's agent, uh, the less that's gonna appeal to the agent, the less it's going to appeal 
to mm -hmm. the seller, the more an agent goes overboard to be cognizant of a seller's needs. And I mean, the nicer they are to the other agent involved, I mean, like it or not, in a multiple offer, that's gonna impact you somehow, I think. It could, anyway. Mm -hmm. So, number six is her opinion. She just said, as long as you keep everyone informed along the way, the buyers and their agents should all feel like they got a fair shake with this method. And do not to forget to ask any of the buyers who lost if they want to make their offer an official backup offer. That's ideal for the seller. Boy, is that something that's come about in two different ways. I can tell you guys I've seen lots of backups come into play. Whereas it feels to me like we used to have backups. I mean, backups were just kind of passed over because they never, well, they, now, they, there's a chance because people are so, I think they're so pushed that they, for what one reason or another, they bail out more often than not. So I don't, I think it's a good idea for even the buyer's agent if, if you don't win to get into second position. You, have, has anybody seen that happen? Twice. You've seen it, what, in Twice. backups come in the first? Mm -hmm. I, I think that it's something that still gets forgotten. It mm -hmm. still gets, oh, we lost, sorry. I mean, I would say 90% of the time they go on without ever trying to get into a backup position. And I think it behooves the seller's agent to try to secure one. And it behooves the buyer that was close and didn't get it to be, to move into a backup because there's still a chance. So. And the backup, he can always back out. You betcha. He can keep looking if so, they find I mean, something yeah, withdrawn. I'm, they're not at any loss, really. Did that? Did everybody get, get that one? Did you hear that one? You agree? Mm -hmm. Okay. Before we go into the buyer's agent, I wanted to ask you guys this one thing because this happened to me last night. Um, the Coming Soon's active no show. So there was an active no show that came on the market last night. It was a condo. I didn't think those fed into Zillow, but apparently they do. So my client called me and said, hey, there's this new condo out here. What can you tell me about it? So I ran in, I go, it's not in MLS. I cannot find it. So I called the agent, she goes, no, it's active no-show. We're taking offers until Saturday. I'll put it live Saturday for when I do my open house. Hmm. And I said, what? I said, okay. And she goes, but we're, we're, we're taking offers now. But you can't go but look you can't it. show it. Can't show it. I said, now, wait a second, I'm confused. Coming <laughs> soon does not syndicate. I know that. If you put one in as coming soon, the new mm -hmm. coming soon, yeah. it will not syndicate. Right. Now, what is an, act, an active, active no-show? No show. What does that mean? That you can click that box, which I thought that didn't syndicate either. If it's active, it'll syndicate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so it's active, so it's active no-show. it's active, right. it'll syndicate. What it says is, well, I remember it from my days on the committee, I mean, what they talked about, it's for whatever reason it's not ready to show. In other words, that they're they're boxing things up, yeah, they're getting right. things ready, mm -hmm. but we wanted to go ahead and get it launched. Um, I've got one like that. But you want to get it out on the on the MLS, I'm gonna right. my opportunity. Yeah. But you can put it out. It, it is active, it will syndicate. Right. But okay. for whatever reason the seller says I'm not ready to show it yet. And so they were Yes, yeah, so okay, so she had active no show. So I called her last night, I said, hey, they're pretty interested. She goes, we're having an open house on Saturday. However, I'm going to go ahead and take offers if you want to send an offer. So, but it's active no-show. She goes, yeah, you can't show it. She got a sign on scene offer. They submitted can't, can't it last can't night. Either, can you? No. Yeah. They're gonna take it. Because I called her this, this morning. She goes, hey, I did get a really good contract. We're thinking about taking it. They're also the seller. I said, oh, really? Well, they really wanted to come down and look at it Saturday. They're just on the fence a little bit. And she goes, well, I'll give you till 5 o'clock tonight. So either you can get in or get out. And I said, well, I, I respect that. It's your property. You can do what you want. So I said, man, I think you might be leaving money on the table. But I didn't even think to look as a buyer's agent's active no-shows if they're taking offers. Because that seller has the right to take it, correct? Yeah, the seller, so the seller always has the right to accept an offer. Always. And as an agent, we are obligated to present offers to the seller. Mm -hmm. However, this is where it gets into, mm -hmm. so that buyer's agent, whoever did that, is a good buyer's agent. They're aggressive, they're not listening. So they're just submitting an offer, they're pressuring the listing agent, which is probably in turn pressuring the seller. 
which they put these rules out there apparently, and now they're gonna now they're gonna cave. Mm -hmm. So kudos to whoever that buyer's agent is. But as far as this goes in this class, if we're the listing agent, we need to stay strong because mm -hmm. not cave to that because that they're doing the same thing that that we just started talking about. Yeah, right? I know. I just said it but was the sweet. difference is they're driving leads. If that is active no show, that thing is driving leads. That's oh, the difference. Sure. See, it, well, I never thought question. about that. Mel, was that was it shown in MLS as being a public uh, open house coming up? I didn't even look at that. Because if it is, as long as it's active, that's, they're they're on a very slippery. Twenty four hours then from that market. point, right? right. Then you, you can't market something saying active but no showing, and then have a have it scheduled for an open house. That's probably a violation of our rules. Right. It's a KW out of, out of area agent that's a member of our board. Interesting. So, which there, they probably can't. <laughs> <laughs> something, to, uh, something to look at. Uh, so, just to kind of recap Susan's deal, any questions on her process? Yes, sir. I'm going to go back to she tells or shows each buyer's agent what the other buyer is offering. Yep. The price. Yep. I mean, actually, yep. and terms. Yep. Gives him the price to the and So terms. she has, and terms. So she has the listing, checks marks the yeah, box, I get that. and then she lays out, so she gets all these offers, and the, the, the uh, you know, the scenario she gave, she got 15 offers. Well, and this is a thing that we're talking about a lot. In her, in her scenario, four of them from the 15 stood out. So what she does, and I've seen her do this several times, is as all those go in, you know, she is communicating all the time with the seller and all the agents so they can really see how the separation, what happens is people fall out, I'm not paying more than that, but then so-and-so is not falling out and they're paying more and that's where you get the auction deal, yeah. but each time is in writing. Each time they change, it's in writing. Each one of them. They change what? The each, terms. Each time they, they change anything. Okay. Mm -hmm. So every time she gets an offer, she's emailing every agent. The yep. Customer. Updating the spreadsheet what, on that what, chain. What I've seen, what I've seen them do is they put together a group text. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. You and you and you submit an offer, and then she adds one. You add that name in, and then all the oh, words yeah, gets transferred. That way, nobody gets left out. Right. And because if one person gets left out, somebody puts off. That's right. right. And mm -hmm. here's the danger. Okay. You have to stay true. Nothing without writing. And I would not, I, I mean, my personal opinion is you email is the best and a spreadsheet's the best. Um, just, just make sure that, that you're communicating really clearly in that, in those last minutes. But I, the beauty of it is Highest and best, when people do high, when agents do highest and best, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with highest and best either, nothing. But the problem is it leaves a lot of uncertainty in the other party. So, so these four in the, on the couch had a highest and best, right? I'm not telling any of them what the other one offered. Right. I'm going back to all of them, I'm saying, okay, ladies, you got an hour, we're gonna entertain offers, we're gonna pick one of them to accept or counter, at the end of this hour, bring me your highest and best. So all four of them do. I know, but they don't know. I share with the seller. I don't tell anybody else what's going on. I pick Josie. Josie, I go back to, I counter Josie because I can only counter one contract at a time ever. And so I go back to Josie, counter that her in writing, she accepts. Well, that leaves three other people here uncertain. And when they're uncertain and they're, and they're, Buyers start questioning them. They start questioning everybody, who, me. Right. And that's the problem with highest and best. And it, what it does is it causes a lot of complaints when agents do nothing wrong. It causes a lot of frustration. I think, I think the agents sometimes and then get the blamed. And buyers get mad. They're like, I would have paid that. Right. So the one thing that is interesting to me in the seat that I sit is, that, is the lack of complaints on this method. I have not had a had an agent come back and say, you didn't do it right. Um, the first time I had a listing coming up where I thought I would get multiple offers, I called Susan and she outlined this whole thing because I knew she had experience with 
local blockers and she was doing it different than the old school. Right. And so I successfully used her method three times and I've had agents call me later who didn't prevail and just say, hey, that was so fair. I always felt like I knew what was going on with the other offers. I didn't do a group text. I did individual emails to the agents because I didn't want all the agents knowing who else was in the mix. So yeah. I took the time to individually email agents and something new came in or something changed. And bottom line is my sellers ended up ecstatic, closed, and I didn't have any complaints from any agents along the way. I mean, that's the only thing I can judge by, you know, I see, I see it working and I just don't get anybody saying, Hey, you're doing, you know, this is, this is bad. So. I have a question on someone like Pelican Bay. I was talking about I had six or seven. Two, I was going to be buyer's agent. And I, I felt like that's a conflict. One was the broker from St. Charles who wanted to do the escalation clause. And then one was related to the seller. I call Dana, and I'm, this is the way I am. I'm like, I, I don't feel comfortable representing my listing on two different buyers. So I hand one to Jane, and then I get the one. Mm -hmm. But I mean, is that, do you see my So story? is there any, so, so just a so survey. The benefit would be to disclose to everybody, and then both sets of buyers know what the terms are. Yeah. But so you can also the represent. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just put, I was already, and again, this was made before all this right. stuff really started happening as much last year. But I mean, I was stressing. Yeah, so yeah. you're not alone. Several people have had that happen, and there's nothing wrong with it. But you're saying if you disclose to both buyers and say, hey, I'm going to represent? Yep. I had one like this this week where I was going on the way to show this house for a guy I've been working for two years, and another buyer comes out of the blue and wants to see the same house. And I'm like, but the beauty of it is, if yeah. you guys ever need that, we can somebody can step in and help yeah. you with that. Don't ever hesitate to call, but there's nothing wrong. Yeah, as long as you just look Yeah. Mm -hmm. is, is there any way we can get in trouble by disclosing a buyer's offer to the other agents? I could see yeah. I could see a buyer's agent coming up saying, we didn't give you permission to tell them what the offer, tell the other buyers what our offer was. You're not, and you're never tying a buyer's information to it you're only tying terms and oh just terms that's right not dollars i don't think yeah no yeah, yeah but you're not giving dollars their names. Terms, but yeah, no names. names no names but they was but still i could see where they would say well, How I, didn't, is I didn't want them to know i had the highest bid yeah you know if they had they wouldn't know who yeah, won see, I, I, I know i get that too because i thought it, about yeah. doing when like on else i thought about writing in the special agreements this is not to be disclosed to other buyers interested in the property saying, hey, if we come in at you know 10,000 over list, I don't want the next guy knowing that I'm already 10,000 over list because then he can bid me up. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you say that again. Don't respond to your offer. I you can do it one way or the other. Well, that's what I'm saying. Let's so is, so can we right say yeah, something like that as in, buyer. hey, yeah. my buyers don't want their offer being disclosed to the other buyers in the, in the game? And that could be a reason they wouldn't get to buy it. I mean, I think you could try that, but I mean, I you know, I think a I think a person could try that, but I think they're going to get eliminated yeah. from the field unless they're you know unless they're substantially over their one you know their yeah. one offer is a winning offer and the seller decided to accept. But if you were a competing offer and likely to get surpassed, you'd be kicked out quick. I probably wouldn't include you in on my everyone else's stuff too. But you could not include in the way you did the listing. So, nope. I, so <clears throat> yeah, if that would have happened, like Kyle, if we had that and that buyer wanted that, I would have countered you back immediately and said, well, then we're not going to play with you. No. no. If that seller wanted to. I, mm -hmm. I think I would describe it to the buyer. I don't think it behooves of us to do this. If we're trying to buy the house, let's try to buy the house. I, mm -hmm. so I can't remember exact, what is the listing? The listing doesn't say you have to disclose. It gives you the right to disclose. It's up to the seller. So I'm not sure that you would have to. I mean, we'd have to look at that, but I, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know that you would have to. It gives you the right to, it doesn't say you have to. Right. It gives you the right to. 
because you know, we're not doing our you know, one, of, yeah. one of the things that this takes out of, as being a buyer's agent yeah. and being pissed off so many times. Right. When you're getting outbid is that it takes that big E word out of the question and that's ethics. How many times have you heard in the background, well, I bet I lost this because Tammy had the buyer too. Yep. Tammy yep. had the seller, Tammy had the buyer, well, yeah, and I got screwed on. And those are the calls you know, and, and they don't and happen in this deal. Yeah, and so with this transparency thing, everybody knows what everybody had. Sorry, Tammy, I didn't mean to use you. But um, <laughs> everybody knows what everybody yeah. has. And that takes that ethical issue out because I've heard that a lot from people. Oh yeah, I bet they had the buyer too, and that's why I lost out. We got screwed. Right. And that's and why we so got screwed. Yeah, when you're talking what Jeff was talking about, it's not your decision anyway, so I wouldn't have a problem with it because yep. you're going to tell them the terms and it's not your decision. So. Well, part of me would make me nervous on this one. I think I actually called you on that telephone. That, that, my other guy was a broker in San Carlos. And so, you know, I had to be, and he's the one bringing up this escalation thing. I had never heard of back in the day. What? Was he, was he the buyer also? He, he wanted to be in Pelican Bay. He had been in there previously. You know, they don't come up very often. This was a really good unit, yada, yada. So, I mean, my phone's ringing off the hook by him. And, I mean, he's being super aggressive with me. You know, I, you know I'll pay up to, I'll, mm -hmm. right in there, I'll, I'll pay up $1,000 over. I'm like, what? Wait, I gotta write this down. What do you say? So, I mean, again, it was a stressful day. And Kayla's just sitting there, I'm on the phone the whole time, right? And it's and a whole afternoon of back and forth and back and forth. And I just called Jane. I said, you know, I'll take this guy if he'll take that guy. She's like, sure, not a problem. It just, in a way, it was self-serving for me. I just trying to, trying to focus on just trying to keep all these balls in the air. <laughs> Which is so let's talk about escalation clauses for a minute. I was going to read this listing. It says permit. It says the owner does permit. The terms to be disclosed. You're allowed. You're allowed. It doesn't say that doesn't allowed. say you have to. What was the question? Well, I was just curious. Just because you check that mark, check mark that box, it doesn't mean you have to. It says you can. Yeah, you have Just permission. Close. Yeah. Right. right. So. Mm -hmm. So. But we always consider terms to not be the price. It yeah. asks. It says offers and terms. Right. There's two different mm -hmm. boxes. Yeah. Yeah. Offers and yes, terms. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Jeff and Mel, thank you guys. I got to run over. See you around. Good to see you. Thank you. Um, I'll watch the video. So, okay. so have, how many people have dealt with an escalation clause in here? How many? Okay, almost everybody. How many people have used one on your offer? A lot. Boy, when we started seeing them, we were, they were weird. We felt like the agents didn't do a good job on the other end. So if you were using one and you submitted it, it was part of a... It was maybe perceived wrong initially, um, and I I feel like they've become so common in our our market that now you have multiple offers. Two or three of them might have escalation clauses. Not un not unrealistic now mm -hmm. at all. I just wanted to see have you had success with them? How do you handle that? A girl in uh, Saint, last weekend told me she's agent St. Louis. She says now everybody knows all the tricks and trades. So she said even they're all in increments of like a thousand, two thousand. So she says some people now are winning by going fifteen hundred. I don't know if they're you know, oh, but really making it an yes. odd number, so you're just a bump ahead of the uh last week it's interesting that you say that, because that was one of the things. Last week we had one that was um it increased by eighteen hundred and ninety dollars yeah. or something. Yeah. Was, I mean I I had never seen and I couldn't understand why. Um so it's still something that causes great angst. Like if you're on the listing agent end, we just this last weekend had a conversation with a listing agent who had never dealt with them before. He had multiple offers. Two of them had escalation clauses. And it was really um, new for him. I don't know how else to say it, but it was new. So. Things that we're seeing, the amount changed. It used to be 500 when they started, or a thousand. Now 2,500, 3,000, 5,000. I've seen them at 5,000 a pop. Yeah, yeah, I had one like that. So every escalation clause does not feel the same. Yeah. yeah. 
The other thing about escalation clauses is that as a listing agent, you can choose to deal with it or you can choose not to deal with it. Right. You don't have, you can have a great offer that has an escalation clause. And if that's the offer your seller wants to counter, but they don't want to counter with the escalation clause, you can do whatever you want. Everybody, does everybody know that? Mm -hmm. Chelsea, you're looking at me. No, I just want the percentage one time instead of a dollar amount. Really? Yeah. I'm not seeing that. Okay. That's interesting. What did you say? I've done with the percentage before instead of a dollar amount. I kind of like that, that's a good idea. Yeah, that's harder for them to figure out in their head. Yeah. Too, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just because that's it's terrible. the highest offer, though, doesn't right. mean it's always going to win. So Did you win one? Or both? No, they lost both of them. So you're yeah. saying you don't have to include an escalation clause. You withdraw it, but how do you disclose that to that buyer's agent? What do you you counter that? without it. If that's yeah. the offer that they want, you know, so, so you, so this. Hold, hold this on a yes, second. Sir. To answer part of your question, say you got a 350 offer and somebody comes in with 355 and you get a $500 bump in your escalation clause, then it goes to 355, 500. And kind of what he's saying is that. No, I lost my train of thought. So I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, but I mean, it, it, to not use that is then you can just go back at whatever number. Does that make sense? So here's the reason. Here's the reason why. So I got a listing at 200, and five offers come in, and they all come in between 200 and 210. Okay, two of the five have escalation clauses. On an escalation clause, it's going to tell you what they're willing to go up to. Yeah. One of them says they'll bump it by a thousand dollars and they'll go up to two twenty. Yeah. Another one says they'll bump it by a thousand dollars and they'll go to two twenty five. If all the terms, if all the terms are good, why not pick the two twenty five and counter them at a number and remove the escalation clause? It's not something you have to do. But don't think that you're tied to their thousand dollar bump because you're not. You see what I'm saying? I remember my comment. My comment to that was, you have to present that other offer. She has an offer that's higher than my offer. Then I have to see her offer. I have to be able to show that to you to bump that. I, I understand that. My my question is because I had one escalation clause that was way up, way up. 20, you mean presented to you? It was okay. In there. We go up to this amount. I got you. Okay. Okay. And but it says you have to show oh, yeah. every single counter That's right. offer and the final extension. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So if you're at five hundred twenty thousand, this guy said I'm going to five fifty, and you counter at five fifty, they're going to want to see that five twenty, and they have every right to see that, correct? Yeah, they put it in there if you deal with it. So. Obviously, the buyer's gonna go screw you. I'm gonna come in at 521,000. So here's the deal, though. So the first time that we had, I can't remember, way back when somebody challenged escalation clauses, it was they used a form from another state, and the state actually had produced a form that was a state form, like our MAR forms. It was their state, and this this person or agent or whatever it was from this other state said, this is what I want you to do. Our state's got one. And so somebody came to us and we said, I don't, I don't think our state has one. So we called our hotline and we got the attorneys on the phone and they said, no, we don't have one and here's why. We don't, we don't understand why, if I'm telling you I would pay this, but I'm only gonna pay 500 more than that next guy, why would, why would you not just take this and counter at it? Now we haven't seen a lot of that yet and I'm not telling, I'm, I'm telling you be cautious with this, but I'm also telling you that when you're a listing agent, just because somebody attaches an escalation clause doesn't mean you have to counter with it. Do what Pat said, you can counter for X dollar, remove their escalation clause and amend their terms as you see fit, that's your counter. You're only countering one person they have a chance to say yes or no. If they say no, you can go back to the drawing board. But that counter has to state that you're removing that. Oh yeah, clause. oh yeah, because that escalation clause yeah. is tied to that first yeah. offer. And if you and if you go along with that, then you have to provide them the other documentation. 
But if you don't, then you don't have Right, but this, for instance, right. But for this, for this last example, um, because of the escalation clauses and how tight the offers were, my personal opinion was they left a lot of money on the table because they just accepted one. They could have played a game. I mean, they didn't, and it's fine. And the seller, the seller was tickled and a little scared. But when I looked at it, I'm like, <laughs> you know, I mean. So you're the listing agent, Jeff, and you get several offers, and a couple of them have escalation clauses, and you're going to be transparent. You're going to go, you have to tell everybody what the top dollar is on the escalation clauses. If we're transparent, what yeah, the hell? Sure. I don't know if that's been included. I, that's a good question. I, do you know? What's well, part of the terms? I use part of the terms. I, I personally have not used the escalation clause. I mean, is she sick enough that I can't call her? Maybe I'll call her. You can call her. Just kidding. We'd have to if she's one one, I haven't, she's I not watching me. She, okay, I'm going to be in trouble. I haven't used an escalation clause. I just. Um, I want more money out. Well, that's a great. I, I think the yeah. answer is yes. Sure. I think but, you do. But you know, just because I have an escalation clause doesn't mean I'm going to be favored because it has to do with all my other terms too. Right. Well, and, on our spreadsheet, that's another line on our spread, another column: escalation, yes or no, and how much. Yes or no, and then it yeah. says how much. Okay, well there you go. And it's on, like on my Pelican Bay, guess what? The, the guy that had the escalation, he, he was the highest bid, but it's so that buyer that's getting it let the mother stay in there for three months at no charge. That was worth more to my seller right. than some of that money. Is, I, so if you do, if on your spreadsheet does it say the increments that it's going up we, or does it I say the to, top bid? You know, every month's been a little different, Candy. Um, it, it varies when you you know I kind of adjust based on what's coming in. Gotcha. Possession's always one thing. I mean, a lot of sellers, mm -hmm. if you say, hey, I just I just did one last last year where they got to stay thirty days <clears> after <throat> close at no charge. The only problem from us from a listing agent standpoint. With, with escalation clauses is it ties you to your last bid. If you, if you did it this, this way, the only issue with that is you're only gonna get a thousand more or whatever that says more than your last deal. Mm -hmm. If you had multiple escalation clauses and the escalation clauses show you that people would pay a big gap, you may be better off for your seller in working off the gap, not the not the numbers, and you could do that in the very last. I got to think about this. You probably couldn't do that in the last portion of that. Actually, you could. They could only. They only eventually. They only can accept or counter one deal. That's it. Yeah, one deal. So sure, you could. Yeah. So could you, you not? Want to try to keep it simple. I try to keep things simple, and you can't. Yeah, keep it simple. Well, I mean, well, just go with that top one and that top number, and just see where that. Goes. <laughs> could you not? Could you not on your disclosures to other agents just put the highest amount of the escalation that each person would be willing to go to? Mm -hmm. Sure. I, I would think that. But, and but you'd have to tie it to an escalation. I mean, is that not disclosure? I mean. Yeah, but they're not saying they'll pay that though. They're saying they'll pay a thousand more than the last. Right. They're saying they pay up to or whatever. Up to up to that makes a difference. They're not paying the yes. the so can't wait. Could, I was just looking at this oh, from that. Susan. It doesn't have anything on here, but this was kind of a while back. But why could you not say instead of you know like up to two fifty or with you know cash no financing, put that as your terms. I think you could. Uh huh. So I have a question for the agents here who have used the escalation clause. Did any of you ever win? Yeah, I've won a lot. <laughs> yeah. but how many times have you lost? I could have lost a whole okay. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, early on, six months ago, and I mean, when I say early on, all this is so fast. But I mean, even six months ago, it was common for escalation clauses not to win, I think. Yeah. But no, now, no. it feels different. You know, you know, Sometimes with escalation and other people are writing contracts without the escalation, I feel, why didn't this person do the best that he could do? Like yes. everybody else had to right. do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why I, I, that's why most of the time <coughs> that nobody wants to overpay if they don't yeah. have to. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's, the that's only right. Way and I, I feel like I stick up for my buyers. That's some, we had this conversation yesterday. Is, what's the best? 
Yeah. The only, so, I mean, I don't know. Sometimes I'm thinking go for the gold, but when I'm talking to the buyer, buyer I feel like I'm defeating them so bad. So that, that's a little way for me to say, well, if I save you $4,000. Right. No, yeah. I think that's a great <laughs> yeah. So the issue yeah. is, our problem is, with other sellers' agents, listing agents, they aren't transparent all the time. So we don't get to see their five their best offer to compete with. I all, you know, I think it's really good. I think it's really beneficial for if you're on the buy side, there's some new rules. And a lot of this, just like what you said, a lot of this is just everything's changing it's and adjusting. And yes, and just because we did it one way doesn't mean there's not another. But it's, I think it's really good for us to anticipate, like what Kevin's saying, and try to dig as much out of that listing agent. I always do. This, you know, what's, what is this? What, you know, Troy, this is an awesome listing. I'm so excited. I think I'm gonna have, I think, I'm, I think I'm gonna have a contract for you. I got two questions for you. How do you prefer to negotiate if you get multiple offers? How, how are you gonna handle this? And my next question is, what's the most important thing for your sellers? And well, you start it, down that road. Then I have you call Donna because I don't work. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you, you see what I'm saying? I, you take the time to ask them, then you might get some clue into how they're gonna handle it, which will tell you how to do it. Well, I think what you said though, Kevin, too, it's frustrating. Cause I had one, two weekends ago I showed when I asked, I mean, I didn't know this guy yet. I tried to bond with him. I was on the phone an hour. I thought I had finally gotten there. And I asked him, how, how are you going to handle multiple offers? You know, he goes, oh, it's going to fly off the shelf. He would not do this style that Susan explained. I explained I can send you a form. There's no hard feelings with the agents. It's working beautifully. I don't know if you tried it. He said, absolutely not. I'm not going to allow a buyer to overpay for this house. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. I said, aren't you the listing agent? But some will say auctions are illegal. You can't do that. Yeah. A lot, I've had a lot of people. Yeah, and he said, get right and he said they're real. He said, I'm not going to allow these buyers to overpay. We're going to get in a problem here, like other states have gotten. And he's, and he's a listing agent. He's a listing agent. So I heard that. I heard that for 20 minutes. I, I, I would call the seller right away. <laughs> I was like, what? I said, yeah, I don't understand. I'm asking you as a buyer's agent, because I thought I'd represent them. You're the listing agent. Is it your goal to get your highest and best? So then he told me how we're ruining the lakes. So I said, okay, that's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> then, this is going downhill real fast. Yeah, and so then I said, okay, well, are you going to do a highest and best? You know why? Will you at least give the courtesy of that? He goes, oh, absolutely. I said, okay, so if I submit an offer, you're going to tell me, when's your cutoff? I said, Sunday. I said, you're going to call me back if you get other offers. Do you have nothing on the table? Yep, absolutely. Okay, great. I called him Sunday morning. I said, hey, where are we at on this? You know, are you going into highest and best? He goes, oh, we took an offer last night. You know, uh, sometimes the buyers don't want to go through the drama. Of and I said, but you you're what? Right. He goes, well, yeah, I mean, they got a fair price. I don't want buyers overpaying. I took, we took that. I go, my buyers are going to kick my ass. I said, are you serious? I said, I, you told me. I said, I played by your rules. I said, I took your word for it. And he goes, oh, yeah, too late. Sorry. Sorry. Ooh. I've I mean, had so many listing agents say they don't check the boxes about offer, uh, disclosing terms and, and offers. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I, I just. How can you represent the seller without checking? It made no sense to me, but we got in trouble. That buyer, that buyer was mad at me. How did, it's just, I would have paid more. Apparently, it wasn't about paying. It was about paying the list price on that one. So, so, so there, there's something else that we're talking about a lot lately because we're seeing a lot. So now that we're into these multiple offers that have 10, 10 offers and not two offers, there does seem to be a difference. There's, and I'm sorry if, if some of you have heard me talk about this, I'm passionate, but there is a difference right now. If you have 10 offers, six of them are gonna be here, close to the asking price, and still have their terms attached to them, still have a financing, still have an appraisal, still have all this stuff. Four of them are gonna stand out. The four that stand out are higher in price they have no appraisal, they have mm -hmm. no financing, they're clean, and one of those four are gonna win. Something is happening. There is a absolute pattern 
of the buyers and the agents involved with the buyers. So if you find yourself, and I'm not throwing stones here, but if any of us find ourselves losing over and over and over, it's time to step back and start thinking about what are some of these people doing differently that I'm not. Because some of it has to do with allowing the agent, allowing a buyer to buy a property. Some of it has to do, I mean, when did we ever see properties going for 20, 30, 50,000 over asking? Some of us are geared to think that's not right. Mm -hmm. I mean, decision. it's their decision. But I'm telling you, them. I'm telling you, there's still <laughs> agents out there that are losing all the time and they're losing because they're not allowing or they're not having the right conversation with the buyer. They don't cover things like appraisal. What's an appraisal really worth? Nothing. <laughs> I mean, you guys know this stuff and I know I'm preaching to the choir because you guys are really good, but there's agents out there that, that, that for some reason in their mind, they believe that that property has to appraise. And maybe it does for certain buyers, but there's a whole bunch of them. Don't, they don't care. And you have to explain to them that the new thing that the lenders are doing now is if you're coming in 40, 50% down, they'll give you an appraisal waiver. Mm -hmm. You yeah. don't have to have an appraisal. Yeah. You know, exactly. the lender will just, be, and so that's attractive. For sure. I heard Mel talking to mm -hmm. I, my, my um, bathroom conversations that I'm privy to are very important. I, I get a lot of insight. You mean in the new house you didn't have two separate bathrooms? No, I still haven't separated that. I do have my own vanity. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. I thought there so. was an echo when I was talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the other side. We're not next to each other. She had one the other day, and I can hear her talking to these people, and, and she is passionate, adamant, talking to them. And I hear things like, I told you I thought it was going to be about 300. And... Da blah 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 blah. Well, she gets off phone. I said, "Okay, you got to tell me a little bit about that." Long story short, was the the listing was like two two fifty eight. Two fifty eight. Yeah, but I know which one it they is. They offered two seventy five. She told them, "Not going to get it done. Not going to get it done." Hey, I offered two seventy five on that one. Oh, you were in that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. We lost. Okay. Well, I, so well, learn I, from that. What I told them too. God love these people. They're driving me crazy. I finally got them to do no appraisal, no loan. I mean, they're getting a loan, but I finally said, that's it. I'm not writing another one with you unless you drop it. <laughs> but <laughs> and can that's they it. buy it without a loan? Yeah. No, they're getting a loan, but oh, I said, I'm gonna, the I said you know what? We're wasting mm -hmm. our time. I said, I'm wasting your time and I'm wasting my time. I don't like doing that. So unless you're willing to write it, you know, this way, I'm not your gal. We just, it's stupid. So they finally said yes. But when I saw that listing come, I said, I promise you if I had listed that I would have put it at 300. I'm so comfortable if you guys want to write at 300 but you have to be. They're like oh no way. I go that agent left money on the table. Trust me. Will you believe me? Well we think 275. I'm like oh god. I said okay fine. So yeah when it came back Ruby put on there. Did she email you? Yeah. The offer was cash 290. Yeah and she put accepting like like the wrong way of spelling accepting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I thought about writing back and putting a little star saying mm -hmm. accepting. I mean, <laughs> first of all, why would she tell you? I thought that was dumb. But but whatever she did. So so the the greatest thing about that whole deal was it turned into a great lesson for those buyers, and that's why you were hammering at home. Mm -hmm. And. Just to qualify, you're not like that. When you talk to buyers, you're real sweet. Oh, I am a lot sweeter. She's real sweet. Really so she doesn't say you have to do it this way. You have to. She's real sweet, but she means you have to do it I this way. I have an idea for us. Right. And but, but I, my delivery is much sweeter. But, but I, I think, mean it. I think we have to be more open than we ever have had yeah. to about what these people are. It's just crazy. Uh, it. Yes, sir. I will tell you, I did a multiple offer on the buyer's agent, multiple offer deal with somebody in this room, and, and I, uh, I offered margaritas and flowers for the listing agent. <laughs> 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 it, broke, it broke the ice. And then we did attach a little video to that one as well. I don't know if that helped or not. <laughs> oh, hey, Donna needs a coffee. Oh, yeah. 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 She countered with a trip to Cabo, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, that was better. I got to put a broker in. Broker. Yeah. 
Not we do not people. accept bribes. We do not <laughs> look. Gifts, Jeff, gifts. So I may be repeating something, but if we've got a buyer and he can't buy cash, go ahead and write the contract for cash and cash in on the little clause that's there. And then forego the appraisal, although he's going to have to have that to get his loan. Not unless the buyer's on board with it, but you well, need to be honest with the buyer. I'm, I'm talking about the buyer. Yes. I'm dealing with the buyer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you got to talk to buyers and, and you got to lay it out there with them. If you forego the appraisal, though, you need they need to know have that the they might have to bring money to the table, extra money to the I table. I have the money. Yeah. My conversation starts with how bad do you want it? That's and, and right. That's typically, <laughs> typically, a conversation after they've already missed out on one. Too. That's right. Mm -hmm. And they're already mad. They're mad at you. They're mad at the world because, you know, we're not being fast enough. We're not doing it. Who's so the, that conversation becomes about how bad do you want this? Yep. Mm -hmm. and, and let's not play games. You bring in your, your best offer and let's just put it out there and maybe you'll get it. But. We, we had a 1,400 square foot two story lakefront. And it was, I think it was 340. My guy came in at 380. It went to 400. Wow. Mm. No mm -hmm. kidding. The multiple offers. See, that's just oh, and it's like, right. I don't want to lose. They're going to get so deflated, they're going to go away. So how do we get all those guys to hang in there? square foot one level ranch that went for $589,000. That was what it went for? What was it? $589,000? $489,000. Oh, okay. I still have 1,400 square feet, 480. It's just, wow. So I'm not impressed on these guys. Where was that? But I think the clearer we are, and the and the um, <clears throat> more blunt we are, you know, I love the I love the starting line of any uh, of all all your scripts today should be okay. We need to have a hard conversation, and then just let them sit for a minute because they don't know what you're going to say, <laughs> and then you say, I need to cover some things that you're going to deal with. I need to cover the difference between a financing contingency and cash. I need to talk about appraisals. We need to go over how multiple offers are handled and, and how we're going to react because here's what's happening. And then you share these stories and it gives you some credibility. But boy, it's, it is. It's, we don't want you guys, we just don't want you guys to miss out on stuff. And I know you don't, but. I had a doctor, I had a doctor. And on this house on Sioux. Uh -huh. Okay, the house on Sioux Trail, Sioux Road. Yeah. Um, 23 offers, 35 showings. And we came in, it's 339 list. We offered 350. Escalatory closed to 375. Sold for 400 cash. I sat there no in the living room downstairs with this open house environment thing going on because people, agents running in, in and out all over the place. It was funny because we got there and he said, you're up. And I said, what do you mean I'm up? You have to lock up. I said, okay. Well, four agents later, I told them, you need to lock you're up. up. <laughs> so I told them downstairs, I said, David, you're an oncologist doctor. Can you pay 400000 or three seventy five cash for a house? Well, yes, but I'm not paying cash. I'm getting a loan. I said, David, you're not listening to me. Right. We wrote it with a loan. And I wrote it with a loan to teach him a lesson. Yes, well, sometimes that's the only way they're going to learn. Yeah. They're still old school. And his they wife just don't want yeah. sometimes, they, they need, sometimes there's nothing you do about it, though. I said sometimes they've just got to they've gotta lose it. Right? And this is the third one he's lost. Right. But, but we started at 250. Now we're at 375. Okay. <laughs> hey, Jeff, a little bit about appraisals. Because you, you, that one email about James and the square footage mm -hmm. thing, that, that, you, that was my doing. How many appraisals have you seen? How, Deals didn't appraise. You threw a number out. I thought in that email. No. No. Um, no. It just goes. It goes. I don't know why, but it seems to be sip. It seems to be cyclical. It just. It just like comes in waves. And uh, knock on wood, like the last couple weeks, I haven't heard a lot. But prior to that, there was probably a month period of time when I bet you. I bet you there were a dozen or 15 of them. And I don't know why it, it moves like that. Um, it doesn't seem to be just one appraiser. It seems to be a bunch of appraisers. I mean, there's there was one that had three or four in one week. He must have had a bad week or something. Um, the same appraiser? Yeah, mm -hmm. but all in our office. So God knows how many there were flying around somewhere else. But. Um, 
you know, I just think that you can't predict it, and so we have to address it. Yeah. So the rule of thumb is with Troy Fred, if, if they're willing to put like 50% down, usually banks will waive that. Yeah. That well, but you know what? It's based on the property, though, because you can yeah. put 50% down out in Elgin, they won't care. But you put 50% down in the middle of LA, where they know, where they have a whole bunch of core logic data about how much things are going for, they'll make you find out. So it's, it's totally property driven. So that's why, like somebody was telling me, hey, you know, my people aren't going to get a loan, but the appraisal, they're going to waive the appraisal. And I'm like, and it's yeah. not just to add on to that because I totally agree. It's not just property driven though. It's lender driven and buyer driven. Mm -hmm. The right buyer well, and the right lender to do whatever they want. Happen once <laughs> doesn't mean it will happen at this property. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. It's just you yeah. don't you don't you don't know, but you got to cover it. Well, so my own personal experience, you know, we bought and sold last year, and I had to do a bridge loan, more of you all don't know, probably, but <laughs> Central Bank, the guy came, a young guy, I think I hadn't dealt with him before, said his name, I said, no, look, I've done all this work, we spent 150000 I'm going to list this house at three fifty nine. For our bridge loan, he appraised it at two forty four, And then six weeks later, went under contract at full price. And my loan officer at Central Bank said, we'd like to share that contract with our underwriters because we're going to go back because I, I challenge the original Jeff I mm -hmm. have been in so many I mean they, they don't even like talking to me because I'm really blind well, you know I mean I'm like you know what that you know what that appraisal is worth to me right well you know I even like, set the guy nothing. down ahead of time I, mean, <laughs> I sat the guy down and I said hey let me show you all the work we did knock out walls kitchen bathroom and yeah 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 I even gave them a list of all the improvements. Okay. So, so the most constructive things to talk about with a buyer is, you know, we're going to put 20% down. Okay, I need to know something. At this number, is 20% all you have? What? Why is 20% all you have? Or what if it doesn't? What if it appraises $10,000 under? And now you need $10,000 more cash. Do you have more cash than 20%? Or can you change to a 10% down loan? Right. So, I mean, if you have those type of conversations, you're less to be surprised. The other thing that I think is really important from an agent, from a buyer's agent standpoint, is staying uh, like a, you know, staying, I don't know what the oh, word is. Versus... No. Like ready to pounce? No. <laughs> so, I'll use, I'll use like every example I have involves Mel, okay? Condo, this is and you've it. all got your, own, you got your own stories. That's right, but... Condo was um, 380, okay? Uh, four offers, goes under contract immediately. Appraisal comes in at 300. Buyer or seller say, wait a second. Four months ago we had a refi, appraised at 340. Yeah. Now correct me if any of my numbers are wrong. Buyers can't do anything about it. Their lender won't let them change. She goes out on her own, gets another appraisal to do it. It appraises. 365. Wow. But the lender won't let them change. We had to switch lenders. So that's that's what what Boom, <laughs> went to another lender. Yeah. The deal ultimately closes, but it very easily, if she wasn't as tenacious and coaching those, coaching that other agent, because the other agent was at times ready to give up. And the other, and the people involved were really, I mean, I think we got to stay more committed than we've ever no, had. I almost lost the other agent twice. He goes, I give up. I'm done. This is ridiculous. I go, I don't lose. <laughs> and we are not losing. I said, I am going to fight. You, did you have the buyer or the seller? So I had the seller. You had the seller. <laughs> I'm like, no. I said, we've come too far. I said, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. We're not giving up. We're switching lenders. I'm getting a different appraiser. I called four different appraisers. Are you on this guy's list? Can I get you on this one? I actually had two more appraisals done. It cost me one appraisal. And you can't, you can't get it. <laughs> I got too aggressive. You can't get it every time. But when the seller understands and the buyer understands early on what could happen, then your odds of holding it together are better. Mm -hmm. You know, because they understand, hey, look, the appraisers are working in arrears. They're having a really hard time finding comps. You know, you're lucky because you got this property, but it may not appraise, you know, and, and then, they, then they already know and this seller, was, this seller was really cool. They buy and sell a lot. And we knew we were pushing it on price. I go, I don't know. We're just going to see if it goes. So it went. So we were ecstatic. And then it was starting to blow up. So I had to go back. I'm like, do you trust me? And she's like, yeah. I said, then I want you to extend for two weeks. 
Let me fix it. I think I can fix it. Now, I'm not giving you 100%, but I'm 99% sure I'm going to get you to the table. And you're going to get the money. Because the goal is the money, right? Just <laughs> do what you got to do. Call me when it's done. I think that's something that's important mm -hmm. to talk about today. I always forget. But just talk about how... how um, um, common it is to have to extend things. Oh, yeah. I mean, everybody's got to understand that. And, you know, the the challenging part is if you know you've got a product that's really going to be good, keeping your sellers from having a too big of an ego or too big of a head so that they don't get crazy with their expectations either, you know, is, is part of the process too. It's it's fun. <laughs> well, Jeff, what you said Keeps with you the going. buyers, you know, how bad do you want it? What I've started doing with who I'm working with, I'll ask them why probably 50 times. Why are we buying a house? Why are you buying a condo? Because nobody needs a second home or a condo or this. You don't need it, do you? I mean, you're going to live happily if you're in your other house, right? But you want it. So I want to know why you want it so bad. So then at least I have that conversation. You know, they say, gosh, you know, I'm not getting any more time. I'm wanting those grandkids. So then if in between 10 grand, I'm like, you told me you wanted time with your grandkids. Is it worth $10,000 more? Because I'll be like, what's your highest? So they go 350, I'm like, is it really your highest? I really want to know because we had this conversation. I don't think I want to be on the side of that table. And, I'll, <laughs> and then I'll lean, lay in, I'm like, okay, because I wrote it all down. You told me your wife is always dreamed about this. You told me <laughs> this smoke. grandkid, I'm going to get you. You are tough. And then she'll, they'll go, you know what, I can pay 375 and then that's our counter. Thank you. Because you aren't, mm -hmm. I said, I want it out of you. But I mean, if I didn't write those down, I can't remember. But I'm like, oh yeah, you're white. Yeah. So anytime, <laughs> you're anytime you're thinking about being hard on me, just, just feel for me. I mean, think about what I go through. She's really good, but you, we've said this. I'm not me, but you guys have said it. What is your true motivation, Mr. Buyer, Mr. Seller? You know, you, yeah. I've heard it. Yeah. And it's really bad if the people have never seen the house mm -hmm. yet. Uh huh. Like I, I had one like that in December. I didn't even meet the people. Okay. Yeah, I've met, I've not met some before. Oh, I feel, and I, I didn't even nervous. meet them at closing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even meet them at closing. But we had two offers the same day at the thing. It was a little farm out in Max Creek. Yeah. And my guy was from Florida, never met him before, nothing. Um, he wanted to buy that property. And I'm like, okay. So we went ahead and uh, I said, well, we're going to have to right full price mm -hmm. it's just on the market today but right now right now we wrote the full price mm -hmm. sight unseen uh, i went out and looked at it <laughs> in between and kind of told him a little bit but uh then both offers exactly the same the same day exactly the same. <coughs> and the agent calls me back listing agent says well, I think my seller's going to end up taking the other offer. And I'm like, why? Why? It was a higher. Mm -hmm. If it's higher, okay. No, they're the same. They're the same thing. But my other guy wrote this sympathy letter. Oh, dang it. And I said, oh, tell me about it, you know. Well, he's an Afghanistan veteran, and he's this, <laughs> and he's that, and he's you know, been wanting a home like this forever. He hasn't even... Both buyers, neither buyer had seen mm -hmm. the property. Wow. Neither buyer had seen the property. So I just talked to my guy and I said, you know, then she said, okay, we decided. My guy was an Afghanistan veteran, 53% disabled, okay? But he never really shared that with me until I told him about this other letter. And he said, well, shoot, you know? I'm, I'm just not one that ever wants anybody to feel sorry yeah. about me. I'm yeah. just not like that. And uh, I'm like, I understand that, Liz, you know. It's all up to you. And uh, so then she says, and we hadn't written this letter yet. And he said, I can write a letter. I can write a letter. I mean, in 15 minutes, I had the most down-to-earth, nothing about oh, I've got this arm gone, or yeah. I've got this gone, or nothing. Nothing like that. And then she said, okay, I'm going to do the highest and best by 5 o'clock tomorrow. And so then I told him, I said, you know, 
I said, you guys discuss it. I uh, told you a little bit about the market, what, what's going on and everything. It's a crystal ball thing. We don't know how much it's right. going to take. But at least you had this. a chance. But we have a chance. Yep. So they came back and he said, well, Christian and I decided the other guy might go five. He might go 10. But I don't think he'll go 15 and work on 15. There you go. Yeah. And we got it. Good. That's <laughs> awesome. 